Hey, Zach. Morning. Have you ever said something that, like, like, as you said it, you wish you hadn't said it? Like, as you see those words coming out of your mouth, you wish they were on a rope and you could just pull them back really fast? Because I have a lot of times. Uh, I could tell you what every single pair of shoes I own tastes like because I have put my foot in my mouth too many times to count. And this morning, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to reference a few different times where I've done that. Uh, First and foremost, about eight and a half years ago, this was about a year after I graduated high school, a member of our graduating class, uh, he tragically passed away in a car accident. We all got together. We were going to do a celebration of life. It was, it, was truly, it was truly a celebration of life. He was an awesome guy. But a friend of mine who I hadn't seen since we graduated, he came up to me and said, Will, man, how are you doing? And without really thinking, I just looked at him. I said, man, I'm alive. Yeah. At a funeral. Of all the things you can say when someone asks how you are, I said the most basic and obvious insensitive thing to say in the moment, I am alive. And that is one of a myriad of moments where I realized that once our words are out, they're out. That once you say something, you don't get the privilege of unsaying something. That you might be able to pause before you speak, but you cannot rewind after you speak. You might be able to take a moment before you say something, but you can't unsay something. Craig touched on it last week that we are to become a society that is quick to listen and... Guys, you pay attention. That's awesome. Quick to listen and slow to speak. Because God has given us the ability to pause before we say something, but not the ability to rewind after we say something. And it's so important that we work on, that we develop, that we hone that tool, because as Craig talked about two weeks ago in his message, yeah, I'm referencing two weeks of Craig messages, and he's not here to appreciate it, but whatever. Two weeks ago, he he let us in on this little thing that we have a tendency to feel before we think, that we are, in fact, quick to listen, that we are in tune to hear what people say, but those words get to our muscles and our actions before They get to our brains and to our thought. We have quick to listen down, pat. We've got that figured out. It's the slow to speak side that I'd like to address this morning. And I think that that this side is, is so important to talk about and it's so important for us to address because our words have weight. Now more than ever, I think we are becoming increasingly aware of the fact that our words carry weight, that there is a caliber to every single word that we choose to say. And here's the thing, not every word's weighted the same. If every word has weight, different words have different amounts of weight, different amounts of force behind them. And there's a lot of different things that can affect the weight of your words, one of which would be context. And right now, when we're in this season where a large portion of our community is with us online, guys, can we welcome our online community? We are all jealous of the fact that you didn't have to do your hair or put on pants to be at church. Um, so, so, so the context of our words matters. For example, hey Alexa, play Rick Astley. Guys, that means nothing in here, but someone that's watching online that has an Amazon Echo, they are now hearing the sultry voice of Rick Astley. (laughs) Context. Okay, okay. I know it's good, right? (laughs) Okay, Google. Tell me about crocodiles. Now, someone else in our church that maybe might not be on the Amazon train, but is instead on the Google train, is learning that you can tell the difference between a crocodile and an alligator because a crocodile shows all its teeth when it chooses to smile as it's preparing to eat you because it is a dinosaur. Yes, the context of our words matter because in this context where a Google Home or an Amazon Echo hears those phrases, it is now sprung into action. And I can influence the things that are spoken into people's homes from miles away. The context of your words has weight. Not just the context, but the content. Probably the most obvious one. 
What you say has weight. Some of the things that you choose to say will weigh more or will weigh less. And as, as a society, we are very, very prone to hearing and holding on to negative words more than we are to hearing and holding on to positive words. The content that's spoken, the negative words that are spoken, we will grab and we will bear hug. Sometimes the positive words, not quite the same. A little bit different. The context, the content, and also who is speaking. Who is talking can greatly impact the effectiveness of words. Modern day example would be, look at our current president. No matter what he says, someone's going to think it's great and someone's going to think it's horrible because it's him that spoke it. In my life personally, I had, I had a spiritual mentor. If you don't know what a spiritual mentor is and you love Star Wars, think Jedi Master. He was training me in the arts of ministry. He was leading me uh, in what it meant to become a pastor, to become a leader within a church. And an opportunity arose for something th that I thought I was, I was game for. I was totally ready for this position. This is what you've been training me to do. Let me do it. And we met for coffee, and I thought it was going to be one of those like, hey, boom, you hired. And instead, after about two hours of him talking, he just said, I, I just don't think you're ready yet. And I don't remember any of the two hours that were spoken before those three words were spoken. They weren't spoken with anger or with malice or with ill intent. It was a statement of facts. So looking back on it, I definitely was not ready. But it was because I held him in such high regard that those words meant so much to me, that those words were so heavy. There are so many things that can impact the weight of the words that you are choosing to say. And that's where I wanna be this morning. That's what I wanna focus on this morning. As we're addressing being slow to speak, we need to be slow to speak because we need to understand the weight of our words and how we are choosing to use them. See, much like our words, when we dig into the Bible, the when, the where, the what, the who, it also matters a lot as well. If I were to give you a random book and I said, hey, could you, could you turn to page 197 and read the second chapter and then tell me what's going on in that book? You would look, bless you, you would look at me and you would say, there's a vampire that glitters living in Washington and you would have nothing else for me. That's all you can give me and I'm as confused as you are. Luckily, the Bible is divinely inspired, but sometimes when, when we focus in on a singular passage, we lose the greater scope and the greater impact that that passage truly has by not understanding what's really going on in that story. It's a little word called context. Anytime I get the opportunity to preach to the students, we always establish the context because it's important to know what's going on. This morning, we're going to zoom in on half of a half of a page of over 1,500 pages of a story. And it's important that we know what's going on in this moment because these words, I think, can take on another layer of weight if we understand what's happening. We're in the book of James this morning. We're in James chapter three. All the verses will be on screen as I get to them, as we get through them. Uh, not quite yet, but you guys are on it. I love it. Um, a little bit of context. Craig talked about this last week. James, the half-brother of Jesus, same mom, different dad. Uh, he was the leader at the church in Jerusalem after Jesus went on to heaven. And he was the leader of this church through some I'm gonna say it, don't get mad at me, unprecedented times. Through some absolutely unparalleled times. See, while James was leading this church in Jerusalem, they experienced famine, they experienced poverty, they experienced persecution, it was a pandemic, it's an election year. No, okay, so three of those were for sure theirs. The last two more so apply to us. See, we are in similarly unprecedented times. We are in the middle of probably the craziest pandemic that we've ever seen, definitely in our lifetime. And we are steamrolling to what will easily be the most volatile November that this country has ever seen. And it's so important that now, more than ever, 
the people who call themselves Christians, those of us who claim to shout the name of Jesus, we have got to realize that the words that we're gonna be speaking are gonna have a lot of weight and they're gonna have a lot of impact. So it's only fitting that we go to the words of someone else who was speaking and teaching and preaching and leading in a time similarly unprecedented to address this issue. See, in the book of James, he chooses to spend half of a chapter of his book, it's not a big book, it's not like a giant chapter book, just talking about words, just talking about the importance of our tongue. And a little disclaimer for us this morning, uh, they did not have social media in the New Testament. I know it's a lot newer than the old, but it's still very old by our standards. So I'm going to establish an umbrella this morning, when we're talking about words, when we're talking about the weight of our words and how we choose to use them, that goes for the words that you say out loud. That goes for the words that are in 280 characters or less. That goes for the words that are following a very beautiful Instagram picture. That goes for the words that are, well, it's someone else's words, I'm just sharing it on Facebook. That goes for the group emails. That goes for the group text. Any word that comes from you in any fashion falls under this umbrella of importance, falls under this idea of weightedness because every single one of our words is going to have a lot of weight, already has a lot of weight. Before we jump into the book of James, would you guys pray with me? I mean, you don't have a choice. We are going to pray together. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you that we are, are able to meet together. Lord, this is something we would have taken for granted months ago, but now I pray that we don't. I pray that we would truly realize the magnitude of the moments where we can gather together as a community. I pray this morning that you would speak clearly, God, that we would hear your words, that what you want to say is what's said, Lord, and I would simply get out of your way. We pray that we would walk out of here with something to do. God, that we would begin to use our words and leverage the words that we say in a different, in a new way. It's in your name I pray. Ooh, Holy Spirit, please be here. Amen and amen. James chapter three, starting in verse two, that's where I'm gonna be. We're gonna go through a few verses. It'll be right there. Obviously, you see it right there. If you want to super inconvenience yourself, it'll be right there on the confidence monitor, but I suggest you don't. Uh, or obviously you guys have your Bibles on your phones. So starting in verse two, he says, indeed we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by a small bit in its mouth and a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. So right off the bat, we see a classic preacher move. I've been in church long enough to know that sometimes the preacher is gonna talk about something that you feel, meh, doesn't apply to my life, so I'm gonna sneakily check Facebook the whole message. James addresses that from the jump. He says, hey, we all make mistakes. No one's exempt from what I'm about to say. It's a classic move. Because now he's got everyone's attention. He says, we all make many mistakes. And then he goes on to talk about our tongue. The fact that it's this tiny little thing, but it makes a huge impact. And he uses culturally relevant examples to that day. You could take a Clydesdale, and with a small bit in its mouth, you could have a seven-year-old tell it where you want it to go. I don't know a lot about horses, but I assume tug this way means go this way, and tug that way means go that way. A small bit can control a giant, powerful beast. And then he goes on to give another example for people that don't like horses. He says, hey, you know a ship, like a huge ship? Do you know what determines which direction that thing goes? It's not the wind, it's not the waves, it's not the oarsmen, it's a rudder in the back of it. It's a piece that is comparatively small, to the rest of the ship, but that tiny little thing has a huge impact on where this massive vehicle moves. And I think to use a current day example, a tiny 
coronavirus cell is invisible to the naked eye. We cannot see it, yet it has effectively shut down the world's economy. A very small thing has a very big influence. Your words that may seem small in the moment, the things that you say that may feel minuscule, they have big influence. They have big implications to them. He continues, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. Tell me that's not out of an 80s rock song. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Your tongue is a flame of fire that can set your whole world on fire. Your tiny little tongue can affect every aspect of your entire life. Case in point, six-year-old Will in kindergarten playing on the playground with some of his best friends and we get into a heated discussion similar to like a modern day Facebook discussion about something super important like what game we're about to play, I think. I don't know. And, and, and we're going back and forth and we're talking because there's a difference of opinions. And finally, I've had enough words. I'm a tiny man of action. And disclaimer, I, at six years old, I had never seen Goodfellas or Casino or any Joe Pesci movie not named Home Alone. But I went from words to actions and I stepped back and I said, do you want a piece of me? I said, what, what? Do you want a piece of me right now? And you know what happened? I got punched in the face. <laughs> Six-year-old Will got punched in the face. And fun fact, if a kindergartner punches adult Will, it doesn't hurt. But a six-year-old Will, it's a stinger. It didn't feel good. The words that I said that felt A, really cool, but B, very little in the moment, it costed the rest of me more than I bargained for. More than in the moment I was willing to pay for them. See, words can impact your life. Words can affect your life. The things that you say at work can affect your job status. The things you say at home can affect how your marriage looks, how your relationship with your kids looks. Your words can impact your life, but your words can also impact the life of people that are around you. See, in 2015, there's a teenager in Oregon who decided he wanted to shoot off fireworks. Listen, I, I don't get fireworks at all. I don't, like, I like to spend my money, not watch it set on fire. Um, but he decided he wanted to light some fireworks, but the city he lived in, lo and behold, it was illegal. So he did what any sensible teenager would do, and he went into the woods to light some fireworks because those two go hand in hand. And as he's lighting firecrackers, smoke bombs, sparklers, whatever it is he's lighting, he lights the smoke bomb and not really thinking, just throws it into the grass. Well, that grass was real dry. And that real dry grass caught fire real fast. And then it went to a tree. And from that tree, it went to another tree. And from that tree, it went to two trees. And from those two trees, it went to this section of the forest until there was a massive forest fire ablaze that began with one tiny smoke bomb. Now imagine this young man as he's standing before a judge. The judge is saying, hey, so you did a total of $36 million in property damage in forest damage, so like we can work on a payment plan, but you're gonna need to pay that off. Like rent's gonna come due on this one. So I imagine he's just thinking about, like he's just, it was a smoke bomb. It was a little thing, roughly 30 cents maybe. And now this, because of this one little thing? Now, side note, he did settle on five years of probation and 2,000 hours of community service. I didn't mention that first service. But in that moment, like that weight is immense. When he thinks about, like it was just one little thing. I just said one little thing. 
I mentioned divorce one time. It was a joke. I wasn't even being serious, and now we're really talking about it? I got angry and snapped at my kid one time, and, and, and that one thing I said in a moment destroyed years of work building that friendship, building that relationship, and building that trust. See, the fires that you start, they are non-discriminatory. It doesn't matter what they catch a hold of in your life. If it burns, it will burn. Your words, your tongue is a flame of fire. And you are not in control of what it will catch, of what it will ignite. This morning, are, are you willing to pay the price of a smoke bomb? Do you understand why it's so important that we learn to be slow to speak? Because one small word can have an impact that is greater than we could ever have imagined it to be. One thing said with disregard in a moment and your entire career is canceled. One mistake that you make because you weren't thinking can now affect everything, can set alight everything that you have. Are you willing to lose a friend over something that you said in the heat of the moment because you weren't willing to think before you spoke? He continues in verse 7. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. Again, we saw it at the top, the classic preacher move where he says, hey, this applies to everybody. Now, now maybe someone's falling asleep and now maybe someone's like, oh, we're talking about words? Oh, listen, I don't have a problem controlling my tongue. This ain't for me. And he says, hey, no one's good at this. Even the best person at this is still not really very good at this. None of us can tame our tongue. None of us can control our tongues indefinitely. We can get it under control, but we can't control it. Think, think about one of the greatest men to have ever lived, a man by the name of Steve Irwin. Listen, if you don't know who Steve Irwin is, I need to talk to your parents after service, but Steve Irwin was known as the crocodile hunter, and what he would do on a lot of his episodes is he would see this giant reptilian dinosaur, remember we talked about crocodiles earlier, we're bringing it back around, he would see this crocodile and he'd say, hey, this one's got a bad leg, and it's in the middle of this giant golf course, and it's in a spot where if I don't do something about it, it's either going to hurt itself further or it's going to hurt other people. So here's what we got to do. I'm not going to do the accent because my Australian accent sounds more New Zealandish than Australian, and I know there's not a huge difference, but I can tell, and it bothers me. Um, so, so, so he gets his crew together. Like, all right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to figure out how to get that massive, massive thing subdued, controlled, long enough that we can put it in the truck, that we can take it back to the zoo, that we can take care of it, rehabilitate it, and then release it into the wild where it is free to do what it needs to do in the place that it needs to be. You know how much work it takes to control a crocodile for any amount of time? Every part of it is a machine of pain. But they sat there and they said, all right, we're gonna take the time, we're gonna do our due diligence, I'm gonna jump on it after we seal its mouth, someone's gotta jump on the tail because that can break a leg and then we're gonna need five of us on its body and then we're gonna have to find a way to slowly control this thing long enough to get it under control. Likewise, our tongues can be brought under control for a moment, but we cannot control our tongues indefinitely. Think about what we talked just a moment ago. You can have years of success controlling your tongue. You can do a stellar job for a long time controlling the things that you say. And then in a moment, in the heat of a discussion with your spouse, you can destroy all those years of control. In the heat of a moment, no matter how good you and your kids have been, the kind of relationship that you've had, when you say that one thing in one second, it drastically impacts and affects your relationship. We cannot indefinitely control our tongue. And then he goes on to raise another issue. He says, in one moment, your tongues praise our Lord and Father, and in the next, they're cursing the people who were made in the very image of God. 
See, in one moment, we're here with Jordan and Jess, and we're listening to some worship, and we're singing along, and we're telling God how much we love him and how much he means to us, and then we go to work on Monday. This is me talking about me right here, and we say something to our coworker that we know we shouldn't have said, but in the moment, it felt really good to say it. The same tongue that worships God, the same tongue that prays, the same tongue that cannot stop telling Jesus how much he loves him will quickly go to someone and say, hey, you messed up. And we will throw our words out whenever we want to without discretion and disregard any feelings or any emotion. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense how we can do one and then do the other because our tongues, they don't make a whole lot of sense. He finishes up here in verse 10 through 12. He says, and so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. I'm glad that he clarified that because I've never seen a fig unless it's a Newton in my life. But he says, no, no, no. Fig trees produce figs. Salty water produces salty water. Fresh water is fresh water. Grapes are grapes and olives are olives. But our tongue can do this and it can do that and it doesn't make sense. In my mind, like as I'm reading through this verse, I just see James on like a roller coaster of frustration where he starts off with like, hey, our tongues, the words that we say, it's just a very small part of our body but it can impact where everything goes. And then he's just on board and he says, yeah, And uh, if you're not careful, the words that you say can really impact your life. And if you're not careful, the words that you say can impact the life of everyone around you. And if you're not careful, you can't control your words forever. And if you're not careful, the words that you say, they're going to curse God and they're going to bless people and they're going to bless God and then they're going to curse people. And it doesn't make any sense why we can't get this thing under control. It doesn't make sense. Our words, it's absolutely unnatural. It's absolutely unnatural. He says you can't get salty water from a fresh spring. You can't get fresh water from a salty spring. But our words are capable of bringing life and bringing death at the same time, and it doesn't make sense. Guys, sarcasm is a gift. No, it's not. It's not a gift. We treat it like it's a gift because it's really fun to be sarcastic. But sarcasm will build you a log cabin by cutting down every tree in the forest. You may feel comfortable. Enjoy being comfortable alone because the things that you say routinely hurt people and routinely affect people in a negative way. The words that you say may make you feel good. It may be fresh to you, but man, that is salty, salty. So what do we do? And I love that this is the end of this portion of the chapter. James doesn't address it like you would expect a speaker to address it. Because again, as someone that's been in church forever, this is what you do. You tell a funny story to get everyone's attention and then you use that story to raise an issue on something that is pertinent today and then you give a three to five to seven step plan on how to address that issue in your life and then you go and you do it and you be the light in the world. And James doesn't do that. Because it's not that easy. Admittedly, when I first wrote this, I had a stellar three-step plan for you guys on things that you can do, something to give you that you can put in your pocket. But then I realized, we really like to complicate things. Things aren't always as complicated as we want to make them out to be. The solution, while immensely difficult, And while it requires daily work on your part, it's an easy fix. What's the issue? Our words. Okay, well, what if we just stopped? And if we can't stop talking, what if we paused talking for just a moment? What do we do? How do we prepare ourselves for this daily battle that we have to undertake? The theologian Matthew Henry put it this way. He said, no one can tame the tongue. Ooh, he pulled a James. No, he keeps talking. No one can tame the tongue without divine grace 
and assistance. You wanna control the words that you say? Do it on your own, good luck. I'm sure you'll have some success, more success than I would. But without some divine grace and assistance, it's not gonna last. You're gonna slip up, you're gonna make mistakes. So this morning, what I wanna give you guys is so, so, so simple. Start inviting God into the words you speak. In this mask era, it's arguably easier now than it was before, because maskless, like, we, we, play, we play conversational ping pong. As soon as someone's done talking, we better be ready to say something back, and then they better be ready, and we just go back and forth and back and forth, and we respond out of our emotions, and we don't think, instead we just act. So what we need to start doing is asking God to give us a little peace and patience. This morning's tool, you remember last week we had, you can't do the two-hand thing with the microphone, again. We had the quick to listen, slow to speak. Inviting God into the words that you say is as simple as this. Okay, take a second, or five, 10, doesn't matter. They're your words, you can take as long as you need to take, but make sure that when you decide to have something coming out of your mouth, that is something that's gonna help that it's love, that we would become slower to speak. I've had the privilege of working with some of your guys' kids in the color rooms on various weeks, and when the kids are being super unruly, I know you might not believe that, that your angel can sometimes be kind of unruly. We tell them to do something very, very simple. Swallow a bubble. And as adults, it looks silly, but I think some of us need to start looking more silly. It looks like this. Because you can't talk when you swallow a bubble. So if we want to become slow to speak and slow to get angry, maybe we should take a hint from our kids and start swallowing some bubbles. Maybe we should be willing to take a moment and in that moment, invite God into the conversations that we are about to have. Because Pro Proverbs 15, 28 says it this way. It says, the heart of a righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. The heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the heart of the wicked gushes evil. Can't gush evil if you swallow a bubble. Take time, think about what you're gonna say. Weigh your response. James 1.25 says, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself. James, tell us, please tell us, James, how you really feel. And your religion is worthless. He says, if you claim to love Jesus, but you can't control your tongue, the only person you're fooling is you. And that religion that you claim to practice, don't try pawning it off because it's not worth anything. We've got to become slow to speak, slow to get angry. We've got to accept the power that our words have, the weight that our words carry. We've got to own it. And then we've got to use those words to love some people, to let people know that they are worth something. We cannot feed into a culture. We cannot be a culture that is willing to throw smoke bombs in the forest talking about how much I love trees. We can't keep throwing around these things and saying whatever we want, but telling people, man, I love you guys, but I wish you were less dumb. That's not how it works. That's not how love works. We cannot continue to be a culture that talks about how much we love the world, yet we use our words as weapons every day to tear people down. In this culture we live in where there's a lot of new words, uh, there's a word that is new-ish. It's a word called sonder. And it's a word that I've kind of been obsessed with for a while. And sonder is the realization that everyone around you has thoughts, feelings, actions, and emotions independent of your own. See, I think we all have a tendency to settle into a Truman Show mentality with our lives, where I'm the main character, it's about me, the cameras are looking for me, and everyone else, they, they're just a part of it. Everyone is the main character in their own story, and the words that we speak to them, we don't know where they're at in their story. You don't know what someone's walking through. You don't know the hurt that your coworker may be carrying when you speak to them. 
And those words, they might have more weight in that moment than they ever would have otherwise. So are we going to use those words to bring life and to build life? Or are we gonna continue to use our words to tear down? Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples by how you tell people you vote on Facebook, by how you retweet this or that social cause, by your stance on reopening schools, by how you feel, no, 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 no. The world will know that you love me by how you love them. So weigh your words. Swallow a bubble. Be willing to look foolish because we've got to understand that the words that we speak, they mean something. They are important. They have weight. And we cannot pray for a divided world as a divided community. Before unity can go anywhere else, unity's got to start here. We can have a difference of opinion all day. That's fine. But we have to be willing to respond out of love. We have to be willing to admit and acknowledge that our words carry weight and use them to love people like Jesus would love people. Would you bow your heads with me? God, I just want to pray for your people, for this community specifically, those that are here, those that are online. I don't know where you're at, but God, I just want to pray. Pray over us. I know that in the society we live in, being quick to listen is great, but being quicker to respond is greater. But God, I'm praying that we turn the tide, that we would be slow to speak, slow to get angry, but instead the world would know that we love you by the words that we speak. That the world would know that we believe in you because we love the heck out of them with every single thing that we are saying. So God, I pray that this morning you would create a culture here of bubble swallowers, Lord, that we would focus on you, that we would weigh our answers, that we would realize that our words have weight. Lord, I pray that you would help these people to know that they are loved. Help us to accept the truth of John 3, 16, that God so loves us, but God also so loves the rest of the world too. Please, Lord, help us to use our words to bring life into a darkened world. I love you so much. Thank you for this morning, for these people that I get to call family. In your name, amen. Guys, let's use some words.